Hello. In this work, we continue investigation of the question of how much direct manipulation you could add to a traditional text-based functional programming workflow. We build on the Sketch and Sketch vector graphics editor. Now, in prior work, Sketch and Sketch allows you to manipulate your output to change constants in the program. And then later, Sketch and Sketch was augmented so that you could also perform some program construction in the output, drawing shapes, aligning shapes together, as well as duplicating, grouping, and making some abstractions of your shapes. This prior work had a couple limitations. First, manipulations in Sketch and Sketch were focused on the final output of your program. If you think about larger programs in the real world, some programs have very small outputs compared to the size of the program, and those small outputs don't provide a lot of opportunities for direct manipulation. Second, the drawing, grouping, and abstracting tools in Sketch and Sketch only operated on top-level definitions in your program. So in this work, we relax those limitations. Instead of only manipulating the final output of your program, we also expose some of the intermediate execution products of your program as widgets to manipulate on the canvas. And then, because when you're working on a real-world program, you're often not thinking about the whole program, you're thinking about just a part of the program, we allow you to focus your attention on just a part of the program, and you can draw in that instead. So to demonstrate this approach, we're going to construct a program that outputs a Coke curve. We want the program that we construct to be in a standard language that's text-based, and we could edit the text at any time. But for the purposes of the workflow, we're going to force ourselves to only do manipulations on the canvas and not do any text editing on the code itself. And then the transformations that we're invoking by our direct manipulations should hopefully produce clean code that you could imagine a human would have written by typing on a keyboard. So let's talk about how we're going to construct this curve before we dive into the demonstration. We'll start with the two endpoints of the curve, and then we're going to look at the segment between them and split it into thirds and get two new points. From those two new points, we need another point that's equidistant from them, kind of forming an equilateral triangle. And then once we have this motif, we should be able to repeat it between the pairs of points. So take the first pair of points, put the motif in between there, second pair, and so on. Finally, we want to turn it into an actual shape, and so we'll attach a polygon to those points, and then when we hide the points at the end, we'll have our final design. Okay, here's an improved version of Sketch and Sketch. On the left is a standard code box. We could type code into it at any time during this demo, but our goal is not to, so we won't do that. And then on the right is the canvas, where the output and the intermediates of our program will be displayed. Now, usually in Sketch and Sketch, you would start with a drawing tool, which, after drawing on the canvas, inserts definitions into your program. And those definitions are used in a shape list at the end of the program. And this final expression is what the actual output of the program is. We now have some tools in Sketch and Sketch that don't add things to the output at the end of the program. So this point tool here. When we invoke it, it just inserts definitions into the program, but it doesn't use them. But it doesn't use them in the output. Instead, these points are showing up because the evaluator, whenever the evaluator runs into a number number pair during evaluation, as a side effect, it emits a little widget that appears in the canvas. So we so you'll see the point widgets as well as various boxes as well that are produced during evaluation in a moment, so you'll see that. OK, to make this coat curve, we're going to need two helper functions. The first helper function is going to need to take two points and return a point that's one third of the way between them. And we will be able to reuse that helper function to get the point that's two thirds of the way between the points. We'll see how to do that in a second. We don't actually have this helper function available to us in the standard library, so we have to build it by demonstration. So we'll just lay out the points roughly where they should be. And then we select them all, and we edit a tool to Sketch and Sketch that will try and find a mathematical expression that will explain one of the selected items in terms of the other selected items. So right now, Sketch and Sketch is enumerating lots and lots of arithmetic terms, trying to find one that can uh, define one of these points in terms of the other two. 
and it takes a little bit, about 20 seconds, but hopefully it will produce the correct result if we got the points in the right place. And we did. We can Sometimes when you do this, you get up to 20 results, but this time we got lucky and there's only a few. And this third result here, if you work out the math by hand, is mathematically equivalent to, to what you want. So we'll choose that one. And you can see that it's inserted this expression in our program where the third point is defined in terms of the other two. Now this is still just a concrete point. We want this to be a helper function. So we'll select all the points again, and we, uh, we have a build abstraction tool that will look at the various expressions that are selected and try to abstract one of those expressions over its free variables. So this third option here will abstract the, our new expression over its free variables over the two points that are inputs to it. And so now we basically have our helper function if we hover over the point that's output by that helper function, uh, a box appears, and that's saying that this point was produced by a call to this point three func. Now, point three func isn't really a great name, so we can actually click the name in the output to rename it, and we can give our function a better name. We'll call this the one third point function. And there we go. So now we have our first helper function, and Sketch on Sketch does some type inference on our program, and it found out that this function that we just added takes two points, which means that it can be exposed as a drawing tool. So to get the two-thirds point, all we're going to do later on is to just draw the function backwards, like that. All right, let's undo that. We don't need these example points anymore. We have our first helper function. Now let's make the second helper function. So we're going to need a function that, given two points, produces a point that's equidistant from the first two, like an equilateral triangle. So the way we tell Sketch on Sketch to enforce this is if we select the points, these pink lines appear. And these pink lines allow us to select the distances between points. And now having selected all the distances, we can tell Sketch on Sketch to equalize those distances. Uh, the math for this is really hairy. I tried to work it out by hand once without using arctangents, and I couldn't do it. But math is what computers are supposed to be good at. So we hooked up Sketch and Sketch to the Reduce computer algebra system. Uh, Reduce is able to figure out uh, a bunch of different ways to enforce the equality of these distances. There's a lot of results because we didn't tell Sketch and Sketch what we want to be defined in terms of what. So we'll just go with the first one. Uh, there we go. Again, it's still just a concrete expression in our program, so we need to turn it into a function. I'll just grab them all, ask Sketch and Sketch to build an abstraction out of something we've selected. Looks like the first one is the one we want here. All right, now it's still not the greatest name, so we'll go ahead and rename it to, let's say, equi try point. All right, and then the box that's here is extending too far because it's extraneously producing this offset widget here, which we can just hide. We're not going to talk about those. There we go. All right. OK. So we don't need our example points anymore. We have our two helper functions. Now we can start building the skeleton of our coat curve. Let's take our one third point function. We'll draw it on the canvas. And it's inserted the function call for us into the program with two new points here. Now to get the two thirds point, we're just going to draw it backwards. We added snaps to Sketch and Sketch, so we can immediately snap to points that exist. And instead of inserting new points when, uh, when we draw this time, it's going to take those points that were there and introduce variables for them, and then reuse those variables for both the function calls. There we go. So now we have the one third point and the two thirds point. We need the point that's uh, extended out from them, so we'll take the equitry point function, and we'll use snaps again. We'll snap it to the two thirds point and the one third point, and there we go. It reused the variables that already exist in the program. Now this is starting to look a little bit like a skeleton. Um, it's again still just concrete points in our program. We need to turn this into a function, so we'll go ahead and select all the points, use the build abstraction tool again, and let's move this out of the way so we can see what it's doing. There's several options, but the one we want, it looks like this one here. So it took this expression and built the abstraction around that. And when it was doing that, it noticed that these two definitions were only used 
to perform this function call. So Sketch and Sketch pulled those into our function as well as a convenience for us. So let's give this a better name. Let's call this the make code points function. All right, so we keep making progress. Now, if we if we take this function and we draw it on the canvas, it's just going to insert more copies at the top level. But we need to figure out some way to make this function recursive and call itself. So we added the ability in Sketch and Sketch to focus your editing on a particular portion of the program, in particular a definition or a function. And so we can focus our attention on just the make coke points function by clicking the box associated with a function call. So now we're only looking at this particular function call and the other parts of the program disappear. And when we're looking at this function call, it also gives us the option to rename the arguments to the function. So we'll go ahead and call these point one and point two. And here we also see what the inputs and outputs to the function are indicated by color. So the orange are the two input points, the blue is an output point, and then these two white points are intermediates in, within our function. Because we have a function focused, when we draw with tools, now instead of adding definitions at the top level, the definitions will be added to our function instead, like you would expect. So we'll go ahead and undo that. So to make this function call itself, we just need to draw it inside itself. And so let's go ahead. Oh, I missed the snap. Let's try it again. There we go. Other way. There we go. All right. Now, if you just have a function call itself blindly, you're going to produce a non-terminating program. You need some way to say, stop calling yourself. So when you draw a function inside itself, Sketch and Sketch inserts a template with a base case and a recursive case in it. So in the recursive case, we see the recursive call. And, the, and in the base case, there's just the single point that we're returning. Now, we haven't told Sketch and Sketch how we want to terminate the function. So in the conditional, there's a special hole inserted. This hole, when it's first encountered in the call stack, it will evaluate to false, and it will take the recursive case. The second time this function is encountered in the call stack, the, the termination condition hole will evaluate to true and take the base case. And th so this allows us to still display the function and allows you to work with the function, even though you haven't actually specified a termination condition yet. All right, so now let's go ahead and add the, the rest of the recursive calls by drawing them. A little snap to that point, snap to that point. And notice that it added uh, to the recursive branch here. There we go. So now we have our recursive calls. So this is starting to look like a coat curve. Remember, though, that the inputs are orange and the output is blue. All of these other points that we've added in here are still just intermediates that are not being used anywhere. So we can't actually add these intermediates to the output directly because we're looking at the top level call to the function. And these intermediates here are actually being produced by a call one deeper in the call stack to the base case of the function. So we need to fix up the base case, and then we can come back to this recursive case here. So to fix up the base case, well, we can focus on a different function call. So we'll click on this call to the base case. And now our focus is on the function as it appears in this call. So now we can edit the base case. And what do we need to do? Well, we need to get all these points in the output. So we'll click the first point we want in the output here. We'll go to Add to Output. And Sketch and Sketch will add it to the output. It also realized that. Well, it was just returning a point before. Now it needs to return a list of points. So it wrapped both the base case and the recursive case in a list. So now we can keep adding points to the return value of the base case. All right. And then this point is already in our list, but it's in the wrong order. So right now, the way you, ha you have to reorder it is actually to delete it from the base case and then re-add it and then we'll add at the end. There we go. And then we'll add this fourth point here to the output. The fifth point, we could add it, but 
it's not necessary because it's going to be provided by the next call to the base case over here. All right. All right, so we have our base case worked out. Let's go back to the top level call to our make code points function. Focus that again. So all of these calls to the, the base case are now producing lists. We need to take all those lists and smash them together. So the way we do that is if we hover one of the points produced from these calls to the base case, you'll see a box with a dotted border. The dotted border is supposed to evoke the elements of a list. So this is actually a widget that allows you to select that list of points itself. So we can select the list of points that came from the call to the base case. And we can say add to the output of the recursive case. All right, and so Sketch and Sketch noticed that we were trying to take some lists and smash them together, so it added a concat call to our recursive case. We can keep going and add the second call to our list. This point here is going to be provided by this call, so we don't need this, this little singleton list anymore, so we can remove that from our output with hitting the delete key. We'll take the third call to the base case, add it to the output. And then the fourth call, we'll add that to the output and finally, this last point here, if we were going to take three of these coat curves and make a snowflake out of them, we wouldn't need to add it to the output because it would be provided by the next call. But we're only going to do the curve today, so we'll add that last point to the output in this case. Almost there. We still haven't chosen a termination condition for our function yet. So right now, if I click this termination condition, Sketch and Sketch offers one option for us, uh, fixed depth termination. In the future, you could imagine it would look at the environments uh, that the hole encountered during evaluation and offer some options based on that. But right now, there's one built-in option, which is a fixed depth. We'll choose it, and what it's done is added a depth argument to our function. It terminates when the depth is less than or equal to one, and then every time it makes a recursive call, it decrements the depth by one. In the call to the function itself, it gave it a default value of two, and it added a slider to it so we can change the depth over here, which we'll do at the end. All right, so now we have all the points for our coat curve. The last thing to do is actually put it into our output by attaching a polygon to it. So we'll take the polygon tool, and usually with the polygon tool, you you know click a bunch of points to draw a polygon, but you can also attach a polygon to an existing list of points in the program. So I will hover one of the points and I'll find the list widget for our coke points here. It's this one. And clicking that will insert a polygon into our program and for the points it will use the points that we already defined over here. All right. And we can let's get rid of this this one. So I'll find the So there's there's our design. And I'll stretch it out a bit. And now that we're done because we're generating this fractal using a, a program, we should be able to increase the resolution. So we'll take this from depth two to depth three. And that's really looking like a snowflake. It'll take a moment for all the little point widgets to appear. And once it does, we'll hide them and we can view our final design. Da, 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 da. There we go. We have a coat curve. So to recap, we've seen how the point widgets and list widgets allow us to manipulate intermediates within our program, as well as how we're able to focus on different function calls within our program to limit our editing scope. So there's still some open questions with this work. We showed off a lot of tools today, but some of those tools were constructed just for the happy path through this demo. And more details need to be worked out so that the tools can compose together in a greater variety of situations. You may have noticed during the demo that sometimes there were a lot of widgets displayed on the screen, lots of boxes. We need to figure out better ways to reduce the noise. And then this work was focused on programs that produce vector graphics, which are naturally visual. So there's still an open question of how do you visualize more general non-visual domains? And then what kind of manipulations are appropriate for those non-visual domains. I hope this work sparks some ideas on ways that direct manipulation could be added to programming. Thank you for listening.